much traffic on the river today. When I was younger, there were all sorts of boats plying the trade up and down this stretch of water. Lots of them used to stop just there. That's the tile yard where I worked all my life, as did my dad and my grandfather too. It's one of the few yards left along this stretch of the river now. But in my day, there were at least seven yards in Barton alone. You see, it's because there's such a good lot of clay in the ground along this bit of river. That's why the industry took off so well. This is where they're digging the clay out. And uh, it's taken up in long trenches that fill up with water. Nowadays, of course, you can scoop it all up with a great big JCB. It comes up with a bucket full. And it gets loaded onto a little hopper along them rails. The engine pulls it right along the track and up into the mill. We didn't have it so easy, I can tell you. We had to provide all our own tools to do the job with, and we looked after them and all, because we had to pay for them ourselves. This is what we looked like in my dad's day. There was no machinery back then, we had to dig it all out by hand. After the topsoil was shifted off, a gang of us would start to dig the clay out. And we'd dig along in like terraces, as it was hard, muddy, slippery work. And we lay planking down to push the barrows along when they were full of clay. These are some of the tools you had to use for digging out the clay. This one's called a gouge, and we used it to dig the clay out. We'd dig along one gouge deep and another gouge wide and go right along to the end and then come back again and go down another gouge deep and so on. Each one of us had a dip bucket. This was filled with water and you dip the gouge in so you could cut through the clay nice and easy without getting all clarted up. This one's called a crummer and when we was digging the clay or making tiles for that matter nothing was wasted. So if a bit or a crumb fell off the end of the gouge you'd scoop it up with this. No, as I say, believe you me, nothing was wasted. And my dad would come down on me like a ton of bricks if he thought I'd been less than thrifty with the clay. When we had a barrow full of clay, we'd wheel it along the planking very carefully, because it was only about four inches wide, and very slippery, or slape as we used to call it. You know, like, uh, watch out Fred, it's right slape just here. And then we'd go along so far, and then a mate would meet you about halfway with an empty barrow. And he'd take your full one off to the mill. And you'd take his empty one, and you'd start all over again, filling up with clay. We did this right through the winter too. Sometimes you had to scrape the snow off the clay just to dig it. And when the weather was really bad, the clay pits would start filling up with water almost as fast as you could take it out. So you could imagine just what sort of a state we were in when we'd finished. When I was newly married, woe betide me if I tracked clay right through the house. I practically had to get undressed outside. Anyway, the cut clay was stacked nice and neatly near the mill for a couple of weeks to weather. You can't make tiles out of newly cut clay, of course. The texture's all wrong. Right. Some clay's wetter than others, or more lumpy, so you had to mix it so that it was smooth and even. This was done by a milling machine. When I first started work, it was operated by hand. There was a big wooden cylinder, and a tapered end, and a screw which went right through the middle, a bit like a giant corkscrew. And when you turned the handle, and uh, the screw went round and round, the clay was mixed, and it was forced right through to the tapered end. And it would come out here. And as one man turned the handle, another would cut the mixed and compressed clay off into dowels at the end of the machine. He used a piece of wire, a bit like a cheese cutter. These dowels was about two foot long and one foot square, exactly the same as these. And each one of them weighed about two stones, so the cutting and stacking was quite hard work. And we'd stack them into piles again, but this time we'd put a bit of sand over each layer to stop them sticking together. And then we'd leave them for about oh, another couple of days or so before they were ready to be made into tiles.
After that, we'd have to lug the dowels around in a barrow again, this time to the drying sheds. Sometimes you felt like you spent the whole day pushing barrel loads of clay around the site, and if you were clumsy enough to tip one hour, your mates would give you a right leg pulling about it. These drying sheds were long, long buildings with a door at each end and shutters alongside that you can open or close depending what the weather was like. And in mine and my dad's day, these drying sheds took up most of the room on site and they were absolutely full of tiles when we was making. In the drying shed, there was another machine on wheels that you'd load the dowels into. And just like the mixer, when you turned the handle, the clay was forced right down to the end. And it was squeezed out through a die. That's the thing that makes the shape of the tiles, like toothpaste coming out of a tube. And we'd fasten the different dies onto the end of the machine, depending what shape of tiles we was making. The inside bit of the die is made of brass. As the clay was forced through, it would come out the other side in the shape of a tile. One fellow would turn the handle of the tile making machine, and the other would cut the tiles as they came out the other end. We used the cheese wire again and a special little lever which made a nib on each of the tiles so that they'd lock together when you put them on a roof. We'd lift the tiles off with a wooden paddle called a horse. So you had to be quick and careful, and there was no room for lack of concentration. But you soon got into the rhythm of cutting, and nibbing and lifting, and we took such pride in our work that we used to press our initials into the tiles. I still get a real kick when I think of how many buildings there are around today with my initials on the roof tiles. And even after having had to do all those jobs at once, a man could still cut and stack 2,000 tiles in a day. After we'd lifted them off the machine, We'd load them onto shelves in the alleyways along the drying shed. These shelves, or deals as they're called, can take up to 4,000 tiles along the alleyways in the shed. And as we filled the deals, the tile-making machine was pushed along so it was easy to stack the tiles. In my day, there was no concrete, and the floor of the drying shed was just earth. So if it was wet, it was very muddy and slape or slippery. There were metal strips to push it along, and if you allowed it to tip off them, then you'd be in real trouble. It was the devil's own job to get it back on again. We'd leave the tiles in the drying sheds for up to about a couple of weeks or so, so they'd lose just about all the moisture. You couldn't put them into the kilns if they weren't dry, they just wouldn't fire. And it was a skillful job to know just how long to leave them. The doors and the shutters would be left open or closed uh, quite often during drying, depending on whether it was wet or dry or hot or cold outside. In the winter, if there was any chance of frost, the yard wouldn't make any tiles. If the frost got into the clay, the tiles would shatter when you put them in the kiln. So often the tile yards would shut down during winter and some men got laid off. One job that carried on was digging clay. So those who didn't stay behind to do that job would find work elsewhere during winter. Most likely they'd get taken back again during springtime when we started making again. That would be from about April. And then, after two weeks or so of drying time, it was back to the wheelbarrows again and we'd have to take all the dry tiles to the kiln. <laughs> 
The kiln is a huge, thick-walled brick building with vents in the floor and fire points around the sides. You'd start to load it up with a few layers of bricks put down in a checkered pattern to allow the hot air to move around. Of course, one good thing was the tile yards could make their own bricks to do this with. Then the tiles would be stacked on top, and when the kiln was full up, we'd have to brick up the entrance door and cover it all in pug. Now, pug was quite simply mud, or warp as we used to call it. In the old days, you'd collect it from the river's edge and mix it with sand to make a very crude form of mortar. There are still roads around here called Warp Lane. I suppose that's where they used to collect the mud from. We had to do that so that uh, the cold air couldn't get into the kiln and the heat couldn't get out. When we'd done all that, the uh, fires were filled with coal to keep on burning. The coal would come up to the yard up the River Humber, usually from collieries in the south or west riding of Yorkshire. They deliver every eight weeks or so, and when they arrived, we got pulled off the job we was doing to help them un unload the barge of coal. We used to do this pretty much as we used to move the clay around, be barrow. Each tile yard had a jetty, and you'd move onto the boat with an empty barrow, and then come back to the coal shed with a full one. The kiln full of tiles was sealed and fired up on a Saturday usually, the heat from the fires is funneled to the top of the kiln and then drawn down through the vents in the floor and up and away through the chimney. That's why they're called downdraft kilns. The fires would burn slowly from Saturday to about Monday tea time. And then from tea time to midnight they'd be mended every three quarters of an hour to really keep the heat up. There were peepholes around the kiln but you couldn't really see that much through them. Sometimes you could tell what the state of the burn was by looking at how much smoke or steam was coming out of the chimney. All day Tuesday the fires were kept up high until sometime on Wednesday, when if it was reckoned that the tiles were ready, bricks would be put on top of the fire and it would be covered over with pug. This would dampen down and stop any air getting in. The kiln would be left to cool then until the following Saturday, when we'd unbrick the doors and take all the tiles out and start the whole thing over again. Throughout the tile yards, men would be known as good tile burners for their skill at knowing just when the tiles would be ready. My grandfather was well known hereabouts as a good tile burner, and very proud of it he was too. He and me gran used to live in this little house, actually in the tile yard. It's still here, but of course, it's not used anymore now. At that time, they had a horse to pull cartloads of clay from the digging to the mill. Nothing's left now except the empty, closed-up stables. When Grandad was young, tile yards were communities in their own right, with shops and a school and church and so on. Tile yard workers never had much need to travel even as far as Barton. When the tiles were ready, it was back to the good old wheelbarrows once more, and we'd stack them ready to be taken away to fill orders. When I first started work, they would often be taken by boat or barge to places like Boston, Yarmouth, Harwich or London. There'd be different kinds of boat, depending on where they was being delivered. This is the type of barge that we'd see regularly bringing coal to the yard or calling to take the finished tiles away. Aye, back then, the river would be positively busy with traffic like this. They say that the bed of the River Umber from Barton to Grimsby is paved with Lincolnshire tiles chucked overboard in bad weather. Later on though, they went off by rail and then by road. When we was loading up, my grandad used to watch like a hawk because it was a matter of pride that you never ever sent a cracked tile. Things have changed nowadays, I must admit, but not quite as much as you might think. Some of the strenuous physical tasks we had to do were done by machine now, like digging the clay.
And of course, we don't have to struggle through mud for 500 yards, uh, balancing heavy clay on a wheelbarrow. The mixing machine, which we had to turn behind, runs off a little motor now. Of course, we still have to barrow the dowels around the yard and take them from the, the mixer to the tile-making machine, but that runs off a little motor too. The floor of the drying shed is now nice, smooth concrete, so no danger of falling flat on your backside in the mud. And uh, it's easier to push the uh, machines along the alleyways now. And as for the kiln, they've got a new instrument now which can tell them what the temperature is inside. No more guesswork. There's one thing that's nice to know, that Lincolnshire tile yards are still turning out a product that's in demand all over the country. Second to none, you might say. And we left quite a nice little legacy too, a beneficial by-product, you could call it. Some of the fishing ponds hereabouts were old clay works that got flooded. And of course, they make quite a haven for wildlife too. <laughs>